Hello and welcome to Decision NYC with Ben Max. I'm Ben Max, your host and the executive editor of Gotham Gazette. The 2021 New York City election cycle is well underway and it's poised to be the most significant municipal election in decades. All of city government is on the ballot and because so few incumbents are eligible to run for their current seats due to term limits, New Yorkers are electing many new office holders and the next roster of leadership for our city. There will be a new mayor of New York City elected here in 2021, as well as a new city controller, several new borough presidents, and many new city council members. And that's not all that's on the ballot. Several incumbents are eligible for and seeking re-election, including the city's public advocate. And there's a crowded and competitive race for Manhattan district attorney and still more. Party primaries are set for June and the general election will culminate on November 2nd. This is the first full set of municipal elections that will feature both early voting and the new ranked choice voting system. Ranked choice voting applies only to party primaries and special elections and we'll have a separate show just on ranked choice voting. The city election cycle would be of enormous importance under more usual circumstances, but it's unfolding at a time of great crisis for our city, raising the stakes of the decisions that you the voter will make. This next wave of city leadership will quite clearly make or break the city's recovery from the devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic and its many impacts on health, families, jobs, housing, education, and much, much more. It's also important, of course, to note that before COVID, the city faced a number of crises, some of which have only gotten worse. So it's an important time of choosing here in New York City, and we're pleased to bring you this series of interviews with candidates running for citywide positions, mayor, public advocate, controller, as well as borough-wide positions like borough president and district attorney. And there will be debates coming down the line, including for city council seats. But these one-on-one -on -one conversations will help you get to know the candidates better, learn about their backgrounds, their platforms, where they stand on key issues, and their vision for the future of the city and the office they're seeking. We hope this and other interviews will help you sort through your many choices and make informed decisions when it's time to vote. Today, we're focused on the position of New York City Comptroller. The Comptroller is a citywide elected position, considered the city's independently elected chief fiscal officer and budget watchdog. The Comptroller evaluates many city contracts with outside entities, audits city agencies to find waste and inefficiency, makes recommendations and proposals to improve city government, as well as other services and entities impacting New Yorkers. And quite crucially, the controller is fiduciary to the city's five public pension funds that total approximately $240 billion in assets and are key to the retirement of many former and current New York City workers. So let's discuss the position of controller with a candidate for that post in the Democratic primary. And that's Zach Iskell. Zach, thanks for joining me. Ben, it's great to be back. Thanks for having me. I am dizzy just listening to you talking about all the races going on in the city. And I am, I cannot, I'm really looking forward to seeing what this ballot actually looks like when you oh think about people yeah. writing, what is ranked choice, what isn't ranked choice. Uh, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be interesting on June 22nd. Indeed, indeed. Yes. And, and even before when folks are doing expanded absentee balloting and early yeah. voting and everything is happening, uh, a lot's going to be happening in June as everybody gets involved in this election. And yes, the ballot will probably be quite long considering all the offices and the ranked choice voting. All right. So you're going to be on that ballot. You're running for controller. But uh, give a little background about yourself before we talk about your platform for being the next controller of New York City. Uh, what do you want folks to know about uh, sort of who you are and what you've done? Yeah, sure. So I've been a public servant for two decades. Uh, my pub public service extends from government to business to the nonprofit sector. I've run a number of businesses, multi-million dollar businesses, companies that have helped tens of thousands of people transition into new careers. Uh, I led the turnaround of Javits Medical Center. So I went there as a volunteer uh, almost exactly a year ago today uh, as a volunteer. Uh, got asked to step in as the deputy director leading 28 federal, state, and city agencies to help turn Javits around from empty hospital beds to being one of the only successful COVID field hospitals in the country. I served in the Marine Corps uh, before all of that. Uh, I led troops through some of the heaviest combat of the Iraq war. When I came home from that war, I suffered from my own post-traumatic stress, sleepless nights. I was fortunate. I was able to get the help that I needed, but many of my fellow veterans weren't. And that led to me establishing a nonprofit called the Headstrong Project. That's one of the leading and largest providers of mental health care. 
So I, I think what I would like voters to know about is this role in particular with Comptroller. Uh, it is an executive function. Uh, I have significant management and executive uh, experiences. It's one where you have to understand business, um, where you have to understand government, but also where you have to understand how nonprofits work because one of the other things that you do as comptroller in addition to the pension fund, in addition to auditing city agencies is approval of 23 to $25 billion a year in city contracts. And a lot of those contracts are going to businesses. So having relevant business experience is important. A lot of them are also going to nonprofits. And so being able to understand how you look under the hood and how a nonprofit runs is also critically important for this function. You mentioned something that um, you, you outlined a bit of your, your background, your experience. So, um, you know, that, that speaks for itself in a number of ways. There's plenty we could discuss there. But you mentioned something about familiarity with, with city government. That seems to be one of the biggest uh, jumps that you would have to make. Uh, can you assure folks that you are familiar enough with city government to sort of step into the citywide role that has such, um, you know, such important responsibilities related to auditing city agencies, being familiar with the city budget, uh, the political aspects of the job that relate to uh, intergovernmental affairs and, and all sorts of things that go into that? Um, is that the biggest uh, learning curve that you're facing in this campaign? Um, I think one of the biggest, I mean, in terms of, I mean, these are, those are two very different questions in terms of the learning curve of the campaign. This is my first time running for office. There's a lot of current learning curves when you're running for office, <laughs> right. Um, right? And so uh, that's one. And right, for somebody like me, I love getting down in the weeds, into details, into nuance. I've learned in a political campaign, it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to get very substantive when you have 15, 20 seconds to capture somebody's attention. I think that's been sort of the steepest learning curve for me in terms of the campaign. In terms of uh, city government, um, I, you know, I do have extensive government experience. I've worked with a lot of city agencies. Um, I think the one of the things that we often overlook when it comes to the role of comptroller is that the primary job is finding somebody who's going to fight on behalf of, of the people of the city. Um, that is not going to get tied up with special interests. That is not going to... Um, um, get tied down in politics. And that is really going to make sure that the city is working for the people of New York City. And I think, you know, the best indicator of future performance is past performance. And I think if you look at my two decade record in public service, that's what I've been doing at every turn, right? I've always put other people first. It's always been about what I can do to help other people have better tomorrows and better futures and better stories. And having somebody in that office who we use the broad powers and authorities of that office to make sure the city is doing its job, I think that's what's needed there right now. Do you think there's been a big gap in terms of how city government should be functioning to serve New Yorkers and, and what it, you know, could is it, be? Is this, a is this a trick question? Um, the bottom well, what would you, obviously, a lot, of pe a lot of people think that, but what would you point to in terms of specifics as to how you know, what the gap is there and, and how- I think a harder question that you could probably stump me on right now is what I what could I not point to? Twerking. And I mean, I, you know, so for example, vaccine distribution, right? I mean, this city acts surprised that we had to figure out how to distribute vaccines. Um, and it's not a laughing matter. You know, this city acts surprised at the end of August last year that schools had to be reopened in September. Uh, this city has, um, you look at our homeless, we spend $3 billion a year on homelessness. It's more than almost every major city in America combined. We're one of the only places in the country that's seen an increase in homelessness, not a decrease in the last 10 years. And we've tripled the amount of money we're spending on homelessness. So I think no matter, I think you could look to a lot of different places where the city is falling short. Um, you know, New York spends 90, $95 billion a year. It's up $20 billion more a year than it was from when de Blasio first uh, took office. A well-run city for $20 billion, we should have free public transportation. City colleges could be completely free. I mean, there's so many things that could have been done with a better run government. We should have been the city that had led the way in COVID, whether it was in terms of the number of lives impacted, whether you're talking about the economic impact. And I think despite the extraordinary resources, despite the amount of talent we have in this town, uh, the principal ingredient that's really missing is our city leadership. Now we, for, for years and decades, we've had people in the city controller's office who have not lacked for ambition, who've clearly been setting themselves up to run uh, for mayor down the line. So 
they've been very hard on the current mayor. They've looked to, you know, maximize a lot of what the office is putting out in terms of, of policy recommendations, in terms of budget oversight, in terms of auditing. You think that has been wholly insufficient? You think the people who've uh, held the controller's office have just been too timid? What's, what's been missing, do you think? It's a really good question. Um, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's necessarily ambition. I think that there's an entrepreneurial spirit uh, that can be used to better use the powers and authorities of the comptroller's office to create real change. So one of the questions you get all the time when you're talking to people about the roles and responsibilities of comptrollers, okay, so you have the ability to subpoena and to audit city agencies. And let's say you find out that with Department of Homeless Services, that there's corruption or money's not being well spent. Well, what next? What other powers or authorities or what, what can you do to change that other than calling up Ben Max and saying, Ben, man, do I have a story for you? Right. And you know, one of the things is, is like the approval of city contracts. I don't think we have really taken that to the degree that we could, right? Those contracts with city shelter providers and nonprofits doing work for the city, there's a lot more that can be done to tighten the purse strings and to make sure we're getting real outcomes um, when it comes to how those dollars are being spent. I think with the pension fund, you know, we have $240 billion. Tom DiNapoli, the state uh, um, pension, uh, state uh, comptroller, uh, you know, he created a fund to invest in New York State. It's created tens of thousands of jobs, um, a 10% IRR, great return for the, uh, the state's pension fund. Um, and it's also created new industries and brought new, new business to New York State. I think there's ways of using the pension fund, especially in this time, uh, to invest in New York City, to bring jobs back and bring um, businesses here. So I think there's things that the office can be doing that it's not doing beyond just looking under the hood and pointing out where there are failures or where things are not working. I think there are real opportunities to actually be an active participant in solving some of these problems. Let's come back to this issue of city contracts and the controller's um, responsibility for reviewing and approving or uh, disapproving uh, of, of many city contracts. You have something interesting in your platform that I wanted to ask you about. Um, you say anyone who, who wants to do business with New York, uh, including city contractors, you'd require a one page memo detailing their commitment to our city. Uh, if you've moved your office out of the city, if you're not hiring New Yorkers, if you're not helping the communities of the city recover, you won't do business with us. Can, can, you, really, um, can you really insist on those things when it comes to contracting? Is that really something you can do as controller to hold up city contracts if, if the, you know, the mayoral administration is, has submitted a contract for approval? Can you, can you put those uh, qualifications in? I will, and I don't think it's too much to ask, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, look, and I think especially in this day and age, we just got, you know, $100 billion from the federal government coming to New York State as part of a significant bailout. And that solves some of the initial issues the city is facing over the next year or two. But there are very, very deep structural issues with our city's finances and with our city's economy that need to be addressed. There are deep inequities in our communities and our neighborhoods that need to be addressed. And one of the, the only way we're going to solve that is with all hands on deck. We've got to get government working together. We've got to get public-private partnerships working together. We've got to involve the nonprofit sector. And I will do everything within my power and beyond my power to make that happen. And if demanding a one-page memo outlining and, and articulating so that there is a spirit of participation and public-private uh, partnerships and getting companies invested in New York City, why not? We're going to have to. Well, I think I'm more, you know, thinking, is it legally, can you legally sort of put in your value statement there to hold up city contracts? You know, is that something that's legally permissible or this is more, uh, you know, sort of a value statement that you'd, you'd put out there that you want to, you know, try to infuse, but you can't necessarily legally hold up okay. a contract. For these Are there going to be cases where it gets stress test? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yes, you can, as comptroller, you know, in the city charter, you have approval of all city contracts. Um, and I think asking for a one page memo outlining a city's co uh, company's commitment or a nonprofit's commitment to New York City, in order to leverage that 23 to $25 billion a year um, to have a greater impact on the city, I think that it's something that we have to do. 
you let's uh, move from contracting to auditing. You have um, a variety of, you've already mentioned a couple of them, but you have a variety of aspects and departments within city government that you think really need a closer look. Do you want to highlight a couple of those? Is there a way that you would try to leverage, use the auditing responsibility, the mandates of the office to audit city agencies? Is there something you do differently than we've seen controllers do? Is there a different approach you take to it? And are there certain agencies that you really yeah. want to get on? I think one of the one of the things that's really missing is benchmarks. Um, and what I mean by that is, is, you know, you can't measure performance if you're not measuring it against something. And so one of the things that's really important, whether we're talking about the education we're providing our kids, whether it, we're talking about how well we are doing in, in ending homelessness in New York City, uh, whether we're talking about um, reducing crime, I mean, you sort of name uh, collecting our, our trash around the city. And I think one of the things really that's important to do is to create benchmarks, to look at other cities, other municipalities, both in the United States and even abroad, and seeing how are they solving these problems? How are they doing things better or worse than we are? Uh, how much is it costing them? How are they measuring outcomes? And creating sort of an index or benchmarks for these different agencies to really understand how we're doing compared to other places. And I think one of the things that's really missing um, in New York right now within city leadership and city government is a spirit of competitiveness. Um, other cities are competing with us right now. You know, Atlanta has made huge strides in the entertainment industry. They're competing with us for our entertainment jobs. Miami, Miami is making huge strides uh, to recruit our financial services industries uh, and some of our tech industries down to Miami. Austin, Nashville, they're competing with us for technology companies. You should not have to be if you're a New Yorker, you should not have to look to Atlanta to find a job in entertainment or Miami for a job in finance or Austin or Nashville for a job in tech. You should be able to get those jobs here. And I think when we create these benchmarks, it's really also about fostering that, that um, spirit of competitiveness of how New York City can be doing things on par or better than our places. What can we learn and how can we do things more efficiently and effectively? And are there specific city agencies and departments that you really want to take a, a sharper look at? Obviously, the controller is mandated to, to audit every agency and department once every four years. But, um, you know, there's, there's often areas of particular interest that either come up because there's issues and challenges or just because the city controller takes a particular interest in a, in a department or an issue. Are there, are there ones at the top of your list? I mean, so broadly, most of them are, are, are I mean, they, as you said, it is a obligation of the office to audit every um, department and agency every four years. I think for me, uh, there's a number, um, you know, ranging from Department of Homeless Services, um, HPD, uh, Department of Education, NYPD. Um, I think it, when you sort of look at some of the big issues facing the city, uh, education, homelessness, um, public safety, you know, those are the big three that I really want to take a look at. Those are the big three, too, where I want to really understand how can we be doing things better based on, on examples and, um, um, and sort of how things are being done in other places that might be more effective. I think in particular with the Department of Education, um, you know, the complete failure to get our children back in school, our public school kids back in school, this is going to have a generational effect. And the longer it takes for us to get kids back in the classroom, and right now, it's, I mean, this is sort of indefensible. There is still no timeline to get 100% of our school kids back in the classroom in front of a teacher. There's no even plan to do that. And I think the next mayor, the next comptroller, the next city government, all of us as leaders in the city, that is going to have to be our number one priority is how we catch kids up on lost learning, on development, on the mental health issues that they're going to be facing. Um, this is going to be profound. And so that is one of the number one things I want to dig into. There's also a lot of things around public public safety, uh, criminal justice, police reform, you know, especially because of my background in the military, I helped build the first Marine Special Operations Unit. I really want to dive in and, and understand better how we are recruiting NYPD officers, how we're training them, how we're promoting them. I think there's a lot that I bring to the table for my military background in the infantry and special operations um, uh, there. And certainly with homelessness as well, um, and with mental health. You know, I've worked in mental health now for the last 10 years. Um, I've built one of the leading and large providers of mental health in the US. And I think really understanding how the city could be doing a better job of, of dealing with that, considering this is going to be 
you know, mental health will be one of the biggest challenges that the city is also facing going forward. I mean, it's one of the things that I hear most from people around the city uh, is about that they can't sleep at night, um, issues that they're having, um, lost work, stress, trauma, you name it. It is, uh, our city has been through the ringer this, this past year. And um, this is something that we're going to have to deal with also for, for quite some time. Some of what you're talking about sounds like more investment from city government. You're obviously talking in some ways also about belt tightening in city government. You know, this gets back to the question of oversight, of efficiency, of, as you said, putting in more benchmarks, uh, making the city more competitive. If you had been in the in the controller's office over the last, let's say, eight years, where you mentioned the city budget has increased by roughly $20 billion dollars, it was able to do that because revenues increased by that much, of course. But um, what would you have tried to have been done differently? Uh, are there things about the way that sort of the city use of revenue that comes in, the way the city budget is structured? Are there structural things that you would have tried to see change in the past eight years as the city budget has grown by so much under the current the current mayor, the current you know city council, the current controller, all in office for for a number of years. Yeah, so there's there's a number of things. One in terms of um, how we do budgeting, that's a big one. Um, I think how we look for savings is a, another big one. Um, you know, so there there's a number of places, and I'll, I can walk you through sort of a couple examples. So first off, the city has used. Uh, um, you know, Mayor de Blasio and, and Corey Johnson and the city council, they've used an accounting trick to hide a deficit over the last six, seven years. So they inherited about, I think, a six or $7 billion surplus. And the city budget by law has to be balanced every year. But what they've been doing is counting that surplus every year as, a, as revenue. Um, and it's not, it's, it's a surplus. But what that means is, is, so for example, if you woke up in the morning and you had five bucks in your pocket and you earned five dollars over the course of the day and you spent seven well you actually lost two dollars but they're looking at it like they have three dollars right because what they're doing is counting that five dollar surplus as revenue so they're saying actually we ended up in the positive with three dollars even though they only earned five and spent seven and so what that has meant is over the last you know six seven years while we have also seen an increase in city revenues that have allowed us to spend 20 billion, we've also been operating on a hidden deficit. And that is money that meant that we were never saving during summer times, during, during good times for bad times. And we know that recessions will always come. There will always be things that happen. There are cycles that we need to prepare for. And so that's number one. We should have been squirreling away uh, and preparing for times like this and savings. And think about what that six or seven billion dollar surplus would have meant for the city a year ago. So much of what the city was unable to do at the height of the pandemic was because the city didn't have the resources to properly address it. That has a very real effect in terms of lives and, and people's uh, lives were saved. Yeah, I mean, not, not to get into debate, I'll, I'll let you, you know, you put your assessment out there, but, but you know, I think there are city budget officials and outside budget officials who, who would disagree with some of that characterization, right? The city had reserves, billions in reserves that it drew down on. The city wasn't until now really uh, allowed to have a dedicated savings fund separately as an outgrowth of the, you know, the fiscal crisis and controls that were put into place. You know, it's it, the, the city has had billions of dollars to, to draw down and hasn't even drawn all of it down during this crisis. Um, I am going to respectfully disagree. The mm -hmm. city started six, seven years ago with a seven billion dollar surplus that it no longer has. And in fact, I mean, you can look back and see the reporting over years. Every year there is reportings about the deficit that the city and the state is running and the pending budget crisis. It has been going on for years. This is not something that is new to this crisis. Um, or this moment. And certainly when you look back at issues that the city was having with paying for testing, with uh, getting schools prepared, with making sure that we had enough personal protective equipment for our frontline workers, for our essential workers, um, for people working in the city hospitals, all of that a year ago. And I'm telling you this because I was there at Javits seeing this. All of that was because of budget issues and nobody had the money to pay for this stuff and the money wasn't coming. I mean, now, now we have money coming in, in droves largely because of, of Senator Schumer and President Biden, but 
a year ago, we didn't have the, the funds to, to provide for this. Um, and they could have operated with a, a surplus and not continue to spend that as if they were, uh, were counting it as, as real revenues. Um, I think that leads to another point though, which is also how the city goes about budgeting. Um, you know, the, the, each year, the way that the budget usually works is the city looks at its projected revenues um, and then if that's higher than what they spent the year before, uh, they look for things to spend on. If it's lower, they look for things to cut. Um, I think that on a quadrennial basis, uh, we need to start to do a top to bo uh, bottom to top, top to bottom, uh, look at the budget to find better ways of um, spending based on the outcomes that different agencies are, are looking towards. So basically, essentially building from a zero-based budget from different cities, that will identify a lot of places where we can find uh, greater efficiencies and savings that are tied to specific outcomes. I think another thing that can be implemented is the program to eliminate the gap. Um, de Blasio has fairly, you know, last fall, you know, re-implemented it on a temporary basis, but that is something that has been in place for decades where city agencies look to identify three to 5% in savings every, every year. Um, something like that also, you know, forces people um, you know, working in these agencies, working on the front lines of city government to find more efficient ways of doing things. Um, I think critically looking at uh, how many employees we need to hire back um, once somebody retires, um, you know, or somebody leaves this workforce, really taking a look at whether that specific skill set needs to be filled back at time, their savings there. So I think there's, there's like in, a, in the city's budget of 90, 95 billion dollars, there's so many places you can look to identify uh, meaningful savings and and ways of doing business better. Let's come back to the pension fund. We're in our last uh, five minutes together, so I want to make sure yeah. that that significant responsibility of the city yeah. controller uh, gets, gets a little more attention here. Um, we've discussed it a little bit, but are there are there other things around the way uh, that the five pension public pension funds function that you would try to adjust? Almost every uh, election that comes around, when the city controller's on the ballot, there's a little more conversation around trying to streamline the the five public pension funds, even combine them. Um, that that's fallen off the table a little bit in public conversation. But is is that something you try to implement, or any other structural changes to the way the the pension funds operate? Any new ways of of thinking about investment beyond the one or two? You mentioned Big earlier? report that came out in 2015 with about 240 different recommendations. Uh, of things that could be done to better streamline the Bureau of Asset Management, which is the department in the comptroller's office that does most of the oversight and management of the pension funds. And I think, uh, you know, Scott Stringer has implemented, I think, about 18 of them. So I think there's, there's a lot of recommendations there as to things that can be done better. Um, I think also we need to look at the Canadian model. Um, New York City right now spends about four or $500 million a year on fees to outside fund managers. In addition to because the trustees of the pension funds don't have man don't have investment experience, right? You've got politicians and union leaders that are on the boards of the five pension funds. None of them are really investors by by nature. Uh, and a lot of the the people at the Bureau of Asset Management, while they are wonderful public servants, a lot of them are are um, you know they they are um, also not career. Um, um, investors. And so that is something that often what happens is, is then you bring in uh, consultants, outside consultants, general consultants, real estate consultants, infrastructure consultants, hedge fund consultants at millions of dollars a year who are then providing some more investment expertise in addition to the millions, hundreds of millions of dollars in fees that you're, you're paying uh, to funds. And when you look at the Canadian model, the Canadian model spends that money instead on bringing really world-class talent in-house. Um, and there's a couple of really interesting things that happen there that generate a an additional return of about 1% to 2% a year, just through some of the structural changes. So uh, one of them is, is it ends up being that you can hold things for longer periods of time. So the New York pension funds, New York City pension funds don't own any real estate or have long-term holdings in New York City. Um, whereas in Ontario, you know, the Ontario Teachers Fund, they own the Maple Leafs, they own the Raptors, they own the stadiums, they own some buildings that generate a long-term return. If you did that through a real estate fund or a, some sort of private equity fund, through our pension funds, you'd have to sell after 10 years. 
And then if you wanted to buy back in, you'd have to buy back in at a higher valuation. And so that 1% a year, um, by being able to have longer term holdings in your private equity holdings, think about what 1% a year is on $240 billion, right? Not even counting compound growth, that adds up very, very quickly. And so I think that there are some, you know, very real structural things that can change. And also in terms of bringing in some real world-class talent um, that we'd have to move iteratively to. All right. We're unfortunately going to have to leave it there, but thank you for the time. Zach Iskell is a Democratic candidate for New York City Comptroller. Thank, thanks for joining me. And it's always a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. And thank you for watching Decision NYC with Ben Max. Key decisions for New York City voters are coming up in June for the primaries and fall for the general election. There's a lot on the line for the future of New York City. Hope this interview and others are helpful to you as you sort through your choices and get ready to vote. I'm Ben Max. See you next time.